In this podcast, we want to think about renal function. That is how the kidneys are working. So whenever you see the term renal, that pertains to kidneys. So renal function is the function of the kidneys. Now, you probably have heard that the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. Each kidney, there's going to be about a million nephrons. Now, actually, the number of nephrons in your individual kidney or your next door neighbor's individual kidney might vary somewhat. So some people might just have half a million nephrons in a kidney. Other people might have one and a half million nephrons or more per kidney. But between 900,000 and 1 million is kind of an average figure for the number of nephrons in a kidney. So if you've got two healthy kidneys, the probability is that you're carrying around about 2 million nephrons, 1 million in each kidney. And the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Now, the nephrons are microscopic. They're quite long, but they're on a microscopic scale. So when we talk about the kidneys and the cortex and the medulla and the pelvis and the ureters, there we're talking about the macroscopic structure of the kidneys. That is the large scale structure. So when you do an anatomical dissection, you can see these anatomically large macroscopic structures. But when we're talking about nephrons, we're talking about the microscopic structure. So when you cut a kidney open, you can't actually see the nephrons. You can see patterns in the kidney tissue from the way the collecting ducts and the tubules run up and down, but you can't actually see the nephrons without the aid of a microscope. We're talking about a microscopic structure. And when you think about it, if there's a million per kidney, they've got to be pretty small, really, haven't they? Otherwise, they wouldn't fit in. Now, there's two basic components to the nephron. The top part is the renal corpuscle and the bottom part is the tubule. So we think about the renal corpuscle, first of all, that contains the glomerular capsule, which we still often call Bowman's capsule. And inside that glomerular capsule, there is the glomerulus, the ball of capillaries. And then the tubule consists of a proximal convoluted tubule, a descending loop that dips down into the medulla of the kidney and comes back up again in an ascending loop. Then there is a distal convoluted tubule and that connects up to a collecting duct, carrying anything which is not reabsorbed into that collecting duct, which very shortly after that will become the urine. So let's start off by thinking about the renal capsule. Now, if you hold your hands together in a cup, that is kind of what a renal capsule is like, the Bowman's capsule. And inside Bowman's capsule, there is the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is a ball of capillaries. And going into the top of Bowman's capsule, that is going into the top of the glomerular capsule, there's going to be an afferent arteriole. And coming out very near the same position is going to be an efferent arteriole. So the afferent arteriole is a branch of the renal artery that is taking arterial blood via this afferent arteriole into the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is the ball of capillaries. After the blood has been through the glomerulus, it will exit via the efferent arteriole. So the afferent arteriole is taking blood in, the efferent arteriole is taking it out. And there's various ways you can remember this. I, I tend to think that A is the first letter of the alphabet. So A is taking it in, that comes first. Or you could think of A for access to the glomerulus. And E is for exit. The efferent arteriole is taking the blood out from the glomerulus. But when the efferent arteriole leaves the glomerulus, it doesn't drain back into the veins yet. It forms the peritubular capillaries before it eventually joins the renal vein to go back into the inferior vena cava. So we have this afferent arteriole taking blood into the capillary network of the glomerulus. And the pressure in the afferent arteriole is still relatively high. The blood is entering the glomerulus at relatively high pressure. And this is important because what the glomerular capillaries and their surrounding cells do is they filter the blood. Now imagine you were at home cooking and you had a pan with boiling water and peas in it. If you wanted to separate the peas from the boiling water, 
what you would do is you would pour the lot through a sieve, pour it all through a sieve. The water would go straight through the sieve, but the peas would be retained. And in the gemellulus, it's a very similar situation. There is filtration largely on grounds of molecular size. So as the blood goes through the gemellular capillaries, the large structures in the blood will not fit through the sieve of the gemellulus. So this means that the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, they're all far too big to fit through the glomerular sieving mechanisms. They stay in the blood. And the same is true for plasma proteins. Proteins are large molecules and they will not be filtered through from the blood into the glomerular filtrate. So this glomerular filtrate that I'm talking about is any material which is sieved or filtered out of the glomerular capillaries. In our analogy, the glomerular filtrate will be the water running through the sieve. And the glomerular filtrate collects in Bowman space. That is the glomerular space. That is the space in the glomerular capsule which surrounds the glomerular capillaries. So the proteins will be too large to fit from the blood through the filtration mechanisms into the glomerular space. That means the proteins and the large cellular components of the blood are retained in the intravascular compartment. They are retained in the capillaries. That means this material will stay in the blood in the intravascular compartment, drain via the efferent arteriole and then perfuse the vessels of the peritubular capillaries. Now, because this filtration is on a microscopic scale, we normally refer to it as a process of ultrafiltration. So there is a physical filtration mechanism going on here. Now, to, to get from the blood in the glomerular capillaries through to the glomerular space, there are several barriers that need to be passed through. Now, the glomerular capillaries themselves are forms of vascular endothelium. This is the sort of cells, the squamous endothelial cells that we get lining blood vessels. And these cells are unusual in that they are fenestrated. So if you think about a slice of Swiss cheese that's got quite a few holes in it, the cells are like that. They're flat, a bit like the slice of Swiss cheese, and they've also got holes. And these holes are called fenestrations. Fenestrations is the Latin word for window. So it's lined with these endothelial cells, but they have holes. And that means that they come into contact with the basement membrane of the vascular endothelium. So we have this basement membrane, and inside this basement membrane, we have these fenestrated endothelial cells. Now, the basement membrane of the glomerular capillaries is a very sophisticated piece of histology because it is actually the dialyzing membrane. It is that membrane which selectively allows what can be filtered into the glomerular filtrate and what is retained in the blood. So we talked about ultrafiltration, but a better word might be dialysis. This is the dialyzing membrane meaning some molecules and structures are kept in the blood, but other molecules are allowed to go from the blood through the dialyzing membrane via this process of ultrafiltration into the glomerular filtrate. But then there's another layer to go through before this filtrate can get into the glomerular space. And this layer is formed by podocytes. Now, sites obviously relates to cells, and pod means feet. So these are foot-like cells. They have foot-like processes. But I prefer to think of them as finger-like processes. So if you hold out your left arm, and imagine that's the glomerular capillary, and then you wrap the fingers of your right hand around your left arm, you can see that there's small gaps between your fingers through which you can see your arm. And the situation is very like this in the way that the podocytes surround the glomerular capillaries. They wrap numerous finger-like structures around them. And because the cells are very small, the gaps between these finger-like structures forms physical filtration slits. And that's exactly what these are called. These gaps are called the filtration slits. 
And it's a bit more complicated than that because between the filtration slits, that is between the fingers or the feet-like processes of the podocytes, there's another thin membrane called the slit membrane. But once the material gets through this, it's then into the Bowman space or the glomerular space. Now the capsule itself is made up of parietal epithelium, parietal perimeter round about the outside, and the podocytes form the internal layer which actually surrounds the capillaries of the glomerulus, and this is the visceral epithelium. So when we're thinking about the renal corpuscle, the glomerular capsule or bone capsule is parietal epithelium, the podocytes form the visceral epithelium and the blood goes through this dialyzing ultrafiltration system to become glomerular filtrate on the other side. So it's a very sophisticated dialyzing filtering system and this is replicated a million times in each of your kidneys. So you have two million of these dialyzing filtering units in your body at the moment. Now we've said that the pressure in the afferent arteriole is going to be about 60 millimetres of mercury. And as you'll know, this is about twice as much as you would normally get in a systemic capillary where the pressure is going to be significantly less than that. So the pressure of blood going into the glomerular capillary is relatively high. And this is necessary because we want a pressure that's going to force material through the dialyzing membrane and through the slip processes in the pedocytes. We're going to need a pressure to make the molecules move from the blood into the glomerular space. The molecules are not going to move on their own so that we have this relatively high hydrostatic pressure of 60 millimetres of mercury pushing out. But of course trying to suck water back in we have the osmotic pressure generated by the plasma proteins. So while we've got this 60 millimetres of mercury hydrostatic pressure pushing out we've got 30 millimetres of osmotic pressure sucking back in. So that's going to reduce the net filtration pressure from the inside of the glomerular capillary to the outside of the glomerular space to 30 millimetres of mercury. But that is assuming that there is no pressure already in the glomerular space. And in fact, there is a pressure in the glomerular space because there's a lot of glomerular filtrate which has just been filtered and that will still be for a period of time in the glomerular space. And the pressure of this glomerular filtrate is around about 15 millimetres of mercury. So again, that 15 millimetres of mercury is tending to prevent material coming out from the glomerulus or from the glomerular capillaries into the space. So we've got 60 millimetres of mercury pushing out, 30 millimetres of osmotic pressure sucking back in, and 15 millimetres of external hydrostatic pressure pushing in. And if you do a little sum, you can work out what the net filtration pressure is. So it's 60 millimetres of mercury pushing out, minus the 30 sucking back in, minus the 15 pressure in the glomerular capsule, and that leaves us around about 15 millimetres of net filtration pressure. And it's this 15 millimetres of net filtration pressure which is responsible for the formation of the glomerular filtrate, which then collects in the glomerular capsule. Now, once the glomerular filtrate has formed in the glomerular capsule, that is in Bowman's capsule, it will go down into the first part of the tubule because the renal tubule part of the nephron is continuous with the Bowman's capsule. That is, it is continuous with the renal corpuscle. So this fluid will start to go down into the proximal tubule. Now proximal means it is proximate to the glomerulus. So the first part of the tubule we describe as the proximal tubule. This goes then down into the loop, that is the loop of Henle, back up in the ascending loop of Henle, and then the last part of the tubule we refer to as the distal tubule. So what we see is that the renal tubules are actually in three parts. The proximal tubule, the loop part of the tubule, the loop of Henle, and then the third part is the distal tubule. So just as there's two main components, 
the glomerular capsule and the glomerulus forming the renal corpuscle, there are three main components forming the renal tubule, the proximal, the loop and the distal. And of course a single nephron is formed from the corpuscle and the tubule. So that means there's really five parts to a nephron. There's the glomerulus, there's the glomerular capsule, the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle and the distal tubule. They are the five main components present in each of these one million nephrons per kidney. So that's us, we've started to think about the process of renal function as we've considered the process of the formation of glomerular filtrate from the blood, seeing that the glomerulus is a unit for filtering blood, largely on grounds of molecular size, leaving in the large components, but filtering out the small components. And small components that are filtered out are going to include water, because that's a small molecule, and also we're going to have some ions dissolved in the plasma. So sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium. These ions are small, so they are freely dialyzed into the glomerular filtrate. And glucose is a relatively small molecule as well that is freely dialyzed from the blood into the glomerular filtrate. And amino acids are relatively small molecules as well. And again, they will be freely dialyzed from the blood into the filtrate. And then there's some waste products which will also be freely dialyzed. So you might think of the soluble nitrogen containing waste product called urea that is going to be transferred from the blood into the glomerular filtrate. So what we find is that many things go from the blood into the glomerular filtrate, things the body wants and things the body doesn't want. So we don't particularly want to reabsorb the waste products but we would like to reabsorb the useful things like most of the water and the amino acids and the glucose. We don't want to excrete these in the urine. So that brings us on to the function of the tubule. And the function of the tubule is to reabsorb these things that we want to retain in the blood. They'll be reabsorbed. So all of the glucose is reabsorbed. All of the amino acids are reabsorbed meaning that none of these products are going to appear in the urine. So we see that nephron function consists of two essential physiological activities, the ultrafiltration in the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, followed by the selective reabsorption in the tubules, the body reabsorbing what it wants to keep, but not reabsorbing what it wants to eliminate.